Over the past year, I've gotten really into the roguelike and roguelike genre on my stream, and I've ended up playing a good amount of the games. And if you don't know the difference between the two, here's an easy way to remember. Roguelike games have some sort of meta progression, meaning once you die, you gain something out of it, compared to the roguelike genre where death is permanent and you start again. And with me playing a lot of roguelikes and roguelites, mostly likes, a few people have asked me to do a tier list on all the games I've played, and I felt obliged to do so. In this video, we're going to rank all of these games. I know, I'm missing some, but every one of these games I've played for a few hours, not a lot to judge by, I know, and I'll rank them on, of course, of my personal preference. How hard are they? Replayability, overall greatness. This would be opinionated, so keep that in mind. And I guess we can start in alphabetical order, so let's start with The Binding of Isaac. Binding of Isaac was a very new game to me going into this video, but it's also one of the more old roguelike games out there, originally released in September 28th of 2011, which I know isn't old, but roguelikes weren't too popular at the time, and Binding of Isaac was a booming game. It was remade into the Binding of Isaac Rebirth in July of 2015, which you can virtually play anywhere nowadays. Going in, like I said, I haven't played the game, but was able to get my first clear in just about two hours, and Isaac seems like a relatively short game in terms of a playthrough, but the amount of variety is in insanely impressive. Numerous amounts of enemies and bosses, a crazy amount of items that could negatively or positively affect the run, and even unlockable characters. The Rebirth version is definitely the way to play the game, and even has DLC to give you more content if you master everything it has to offer. With my short amount of time, I'd honestly put Binding of Isaac Rebirth in the high B or the low A category for now. Great replayability, super simple controls, a wide variety of items, which is something I really love, and one of the most well-known and oldest roguelike games that still hold up to this day. With an asking price of about $15, not including the DLC, or about $5 for the original version, but don't buy that, that's torture, it's not really that bad. I think you'll get your money's worth easily. Okay, Binding of Isaac was great fun, but next on the tier list for ranking is Darkest Dungeon. And I'll be honest, if you watch my stream, you will 100% know I have a very, very soft spot for Darkest Dungeon. I've played this game for almost 200 hours total, which isn't that much, but I find myself always wanting to play more. Now, Darkest Dungeon was first put into early access in 2016, and then fully released in 2017. You go through procedurally generated dungeons across four levels, not including DLC, with a certain goal in mind. You collect items, heirlooms, and eventually can fight a boss. You can recruit up to 15 different classes, with each class having different attacks and strong suits. Some classes will be better with stress healing, some better at tanking. Each class can be good, and a large number of classes allow you to mix and match with endless possibilities. You can level up the characters as well in the town, which is your home base. You can even level up the town buildings up with heirlooms you find in dungeons. Darkest Dungeon is an easy S in my opinion. A lot of people will disagree with me on how hard the game is, and how long it can take to finish a complete run. My first run took me almost 85 hours total. Granted, my second run took about 45 hours, but still very time consuming. I love the turn-based combat and the endless amount of variety of characters and moves they have. Every time I play the game, I feel like I learn something new, which is why, despite having some very big flaws, I give Darkest Dungeon an easy S tier, but it's also my personal favorite, so I definitely have some bias. Now, the next game on this list is not S tier, and that's Darkest Dungeon 2. Yeah, sorry, Red Hook Studios. Darkest Dungeon 2 is the anticipated sequel to Darkest Dungeon, and it's been an early access on Epic Game Store since October of 2021. The game is still good, but it doesn't have the same feeling as the original. It has only a handful of the original cast, and the runs are much shorter. You can go through an entire run in about 4-5 to five hours, I'd say. Red Hook Studios made this game feel much more of a roguelike compared to the original, which isn't bad, but I find it much harder to sink in countless amounts of hours, or to play more than one run at a time. Almost every game on this list, I want to do multiple runs in a row. The combat is still turn-based, and I will say the animation upgrades do look beautiful. I love them, along with the lore of every character that was added. You unlock new moves for each character by learning about their lore in a run. Really, I'd give Darkest Dungeon 2 a B on this list. The overall structure of the game is good, but the meat on these bones is just a little too rare for me at the moment. I can't fall in love with the characters on my run like I did with the original, and I really don't care if they die. But will this game be the worst on the list with a B? Because next game on our list is Dead Cells, and this game is another really hard one. It was fully released in August of 2018 after a year of early access. And Dead Cells is one of the roguelikes that people consider a Souls-like and a Metroidvania-like, as it holds some aspects of a Metroidvania and a Souls game, making the game really hard. 
Death Cells is one of the games I still haven't had a clear in yet, but I still feel the game overall is really fun. Enemies are very strong and you need to memorize their movesets so you can dodge well or block an attack. Now every run you do has cells and gold as a currency. Gold allows you to buy items in the game and modify your current weapons. Cells allow you to unlock blueprints for weapons so you can find them in the run or upgrade your character as a whole. And like I said, one thing I like is variety in this game has a lot of different items and a lot of different weapons and they're all based around colors. Brutality red, tactics for purple and survival for green. You need to decide in your run which one is the best upgrade as every run you get multiple upgrades towards one of those colors and that gives you weapon damage and more health. Really Dead Cells has so much to talk about in so little time. Like most games on this it has a large variety of items that allow for easy replayability. It's sold over 6 million copies since launch for a reason, and with that said, I'm putting Dead Cells in the A tier. Lots of replayability, lots of items, and the game even has DLCs you can buy for even more content. Yeah, Dead Cells is really hard, but a lot of roguelikes are. Just like this next game, Enter the Gungeon. This is another one I haven't been able to play too much of, so I might miss a few vital things on that. And for that, I apologize. I will say, I won't be talking about Exit the Gungeon as I've never played that, but Enter the Gungeon is a bullet hell dungeon crawler roguelike with a lot of death and is very complex. It's one of the roguelikes I've wanted to play a lot more of, but I've never found the time. It was released April 5th of 2016, so the game's been out for quite some time, and it has a lot. Lots of weapons, items, and enemies. The drop down style and the control stick aiming, on a controller at least it's the control stick, feels really good along with the dodge mechanic it has. Multiple different characters you can play from who all have their own start in weapons, and along with that you can still unlock more playable characters as you delve further into the game. Like most of these games, Gungeon has its own currency you save after every run that allows you to buy more special items which will have a chance to appear in the run. Now where I rank this game will have to be in the high B tier just because of my lack of game time and experience with it. Which is a horrible excuse. I know a lot of people really love Gungeon. I need to play it more before I can put it in the A tier. I'm sorry. Now the next one is a game I've played more than Gungeon, but that could be for better or worse, and it's Gunfire Reborn, which is a roguelike first person shooter. And like all these games, it has a lot of items and variety. It was first put into early access on Steam in May of 2020, and a fish release from early access in November of 2021. It has about four acts total in a single run, and has four difficulties total with normal, elite, Nightmare and Reincarnation, which has eight levels total compared to the four acts of the previous difficulties. That's a lot. Did you get did you get all that? And after every single run, you can upgrade your traits with the soul essence you gain through the run, and you have five trees of talent upgrades that will affect any character you use, and then each playable character has a small amount of upgrades available. Now, inside of a run, you can upgrade your weapons and stats yourself to do with different elemental damage. You can upgrade speed, shields, everything. This game has a lot to learn, and I wish I've played more of it, but I've only played for about 10 hours with friends, and that's something that Gunfire has that you don't see in too many roguelikes, and that's multiplayer. You can play with up to three other people total in a run, and the more people you have, the harder the run is. But you have more firepower. As someone who enjoys first-person shooter games and roguelikes, I thought I'd love this game. And don't get me wrong, I do enjoy it, but I don't feel too strongly to play multiple runs in a single sit-in, or too often to be honest. It's a fun time with friends, but overall the gunplay feels average. It's balanced, but... I'd put Gunfire Reborn on the B tier, right behind that to the Gungeon for now. Alright, let's see here, what's next? Oh, this game. I knew it would come soon, and it's Hades. Probably the most popular roguelike game ever. Can't look at a best roguelike games list ever and not see Hades on it. It really is just an amazing game. It was released in the early access in 2018 and then fully released in September of 2020, and you play as Zagreus, the son of Hades, the god of the underworld, as you try to escape the underworld as you battle through Elysium, Asphodel, and Tartarus, and eventually you fight your way to Hades himself. It's definitely one of my most played games, so I do know more about it, but the story is deep and the amount of variety with weapons, boons, keepsakes can keep you playing for hours on end. The voice acting from every Greek goddess you encounter and other NPCs like Meg, Dusa, even Charon is just amazing. The story of the game is so well written and told behind the amazing gameplay that it's so easy to see why so many people get addicted to Hades. I have to put Hades at an S tier, I feel like it's a crime if I didn't. It would be my personal favorite if not for Darkest Dungeon. It's one of those games I can pick up anytime and enjoy it. Now, what can top one of the greatest games ever made? Well, I don't know, but I do know Have a Nice Death is another great roguelike. Not as good as Hades, of course, but I personally have had my fair share of fun with it. It's a very new game that was put into early access in March of 2022. You play as Death and go through five areas with six levels each, 
fight in enemies with your trusty scythe and whatever weapons and abilities you could find. The game has two different types of weapons. One that is just a normal weapon with a cooldown, and then one that's a spell that costs mana. You can upgrade health, damage, mana all throughout the run via curses, which can lead to some absolutely insane runs. These runs are so busted, I've beaten the final boss with one hand. I'm not trying to brag or anything, I'm just saying the balancing could use some work. Okay, but after every run, you earn ingots, which can be used to unlock new weapons that can drop every run, or food that you can find. Overall, the game is a lot of fun, but with its current balancing, it can get a little stale after a few victorious runs. And with that, I'm putting Have a Nice Death in the B tier right under Enter the Gungeon, but ahead of Gunfire Reborn. The balancing isn't great, and the amount of inconsistency with health items or finding weapons can be rough, but the game is still in early access and has super smooth movement in combat, which can help make up for the negatives. And Neon Abyss is what we have next, and this is... a game. It was released July 14th of 2020, and this roguelike is an action platformer that features a lot of item diversity and a somewhat large cast of playable characters. It supposedly has over 500 items and over 100 enemies, which is great variety, and the guns seem good, but from my experience, the movement didn't feel too smooth, and the way you shoot with a control stick, which is the same way you do it with enter the gungeon it just did not feel too good with a platformer for me along with that i felt it took a very long time to unlock more than two characters the skill tree of unlocks was also a little confusing maybe it's a lack of playing time to fully understand the game but for my experience with this i have to put it in c tier for now maybe if i play it more i could bump it up but this game just did not feel as good as others okay and next is actually one of the hardest roguelikes that i've played and when I mean hardest, I mean hardest to learn and pick up, and that's one step from Eden. It was released in March of 2020, and it's a deck building take on the roguelike genre. Kind of like Slay the Spire, but it's much harder. The general combat gets compared to Mega Man Battle Network, which I personally have never played. All the combat takes place on a 4x4 grid, and each of your cards can do multiple things that you would expect, like attack, buff you with shields, or even place down a wall or friendly turret for you. Our run consists of you going through multiple levels and each level having a certain path you take and each path can involve fighting enemies, hazards, bosses, shops, you know, the usual thing. And after every fight, you can get an extra card for your deck if you want it. And sometimes you can even get an artifact, which acts as a buff that lasts the entire run. In terms of replayability, this game does it really well. You can unlock multiple characters, and all the characters you unlock you can interact with in your run as most of them are bosses. And each character has different start and loadouts, where you start with a different item and different cards. Like I said, this was the hardest roguelike for me to learn, and with that being said, I feel like a lot of people could get frustrated with it rather easily with the two-way approach of needing to have a lot of skill and strategy, not just one of them. You need to learn the moveset of enemies and bosses as you'll be defeated by them a lot. And on top of that, you're still going to be trying to remember exactly where your cards will attack on the grid or what your card even does. Even with it being the most difficult, I feel this game is one of the best deck building roguelikes with replayability and variety in gameplay. And that's why I'm putting it high in the B category ahead of Enter the Gungeon. Sorry, Gungeon fans, if you got this far in the video. All right, speaking of Gungeon, let's talk about some hot bullet hell action that you can only get on the PlayStation 5, and that's Returnal which was released April 30th of 2021. It's a third-person shooter with some psychological horror mix in there. You play as an Astra Corporation explorer, Celine Vassos, who wants to explore an off-limits planet to investigate a signal that seems familiar to her. The main story of the game has three giant levels that you go through, and throughout the levels you fight aliens, you level up your suit's integrity, which is your health, with resin and pick up artifacts, which are buffs for a run. Along with that, you can pick up Parasites, which give you a buff and a debuff. You can decide if the buff is worth whatever negative effect you will also receive. And one last thing you can receive is a Malfunction, which acts as a negative side effect in your run that you can get rid of by accomplishing a certain task. I've personally only cleared the game once, and I still have a lot more of the main story to do, but I do feel the main story can get tedious. When the game first released, you were not allowed to pause any of your runs, which resulted in you needing to finish whatever run you were doing, which negatively affected a lot of people's experience. Now today, while playing it, they've added a lot, and I haven't finished the main story like I said, but that's because of another update they added called the Tower of Sisyphus. In the tower, it's just an endless tower fighting through enemies and trying to get the highest score possible. It's really addicting, trust me. And then along with that tower, they also added co-op to the main story. I do believe this is the best PlayStation 5 exclusive game. Sorry, Horizon Forbidden West. And the recent updates with the tower and co-op add so much more value to the game. If I was judging the base game, I'd probably throw it in the B tier, to be honest. But with everything they have, this game is easily A tier and one of the best bullet hell roguelikes you could pick up. If you have a PlayStation 5, I highly suggest looking into it. And if you have a PlayStation 5, here's another game you might want to pick up. And this one is a rather unique one, I'd say. 
and it's one of the kind, and that's Sifu, which was released on February 8th of 2022. It's a beat-em-up fight in roguelike, and it's another one that's really hard. Not as hard as One Step from Eden, but it's definitely close. But they're also totally different games, so you can't really compare them too much. In Sifu, you play through five levels, all ending with a boss who are part of a gang that killed your family. The main character doesn't seem to have a name, so yeah, we're just gonna go with it. But through the levels, you fight enemies with Bak Mei, Kung Fu, and killing enemies gets you XP. Now, the way this game is a roguelike is when you die, you can spend your XP to unlock new moves. And after unlocking a certain move about five times, you permanently unlock it for every single run, and a run is permanently over if you die when you're over the age of 70, because every death, your character gets a little bit older, which is very unique. I personally really did enjoy Sifu and really stunk at it. The game absolutely kicked my butt. But I did end up beating the game once, and a fun thing with Sifu is throughout the levels, you can pick up items which will unlock shortcuts in previous levels, so you can get to the boss much faster if you feel like fighting them again. But even with the shortcuts, after beating the game once, I don't feel a super strong desire to replay the game. It's definitely one of the most unique games on the list, but in terms of replayability, it might be towards the bottom. The overall gameplay is great and makes you want to get better, but with all that and not having too much to unlock, I have to put Sifu in the B tier right ahead of Gunfire Reborn. All right, we're running low on games, but next we got Skull the Hero Slayer, which released in the early access in February of 2020 and got its official release in January of 2021. You play as Skull, the last skeleton that can save the Demon King from the evil humans. You play through four chapters, with each chapter ending in a boss, as in tradition in most games. The most unique thing with Skull is, well, the Skulls throughout the game. Each Skull has a different moveset and can be upgraded either one to three times with the in-game item Bone Fragments, which you can find in the run. Besides the Skulls, you still have another item you can pick up called Quintessence. They act as like a skill or an ultimate on a cooldown. Now, the big roguelike aspect for this is the trait system in the game. Every run, killing enemies grants you an item called Dark Quartz, and with the Dark Quartz, you can permanently upgrade your character to do more damage, have lower cooldowns, have more health, or even have an extra life, along with much, much more. Personally, for me, I really enjoyed Skull. I still have yet to clear a run in the game, but every time I pick it up, I find myself playing for multiple hours, telling myself just one more try. The vast amount of skulls, which all can be upgraded, makes the game very refreshing in multiple runs. It's very difficult as the bosses have a lot of moves and will kick your butt quite a bit. But the very cute retro 2D graphics, along with the nice platforming and what seems to be an endless amount of items, makes Skull one of my favorite roguelikes ever, which is why I'm putting it right behind Dead Cells in the A tier. Okay, let me see here. Oh, Slay the Spires, the next one of the most popular roguelikes out there and definitely the most popular deck building roguelike. It was released in the early access in November of 2017 and fully released in January of 2019 and even added an extra character to play as in early 2020. The main game mode has you pick between four different characters. First time playing, you only have one, but the others are easy to unlock and each character has their own set of cards attached to them. There are three levels in each run and each level has you ascend a spire where you pick a path you want to take. You can fight enemies, elites, camp for health, or upgrade a card, run into a shop, or just random encounters where you have to pick and choose an outcome. Every time a run fails, you gain XP towards the character you used and unlock more cards that can be found. Along your run, you also find relics, which are buffs for the run, and potions, which are a one-time use that provides a buff in battle. Besides for the main game, it also has a daily challenge and ascension mode, which is just a challenge mode, really. I've cleared the main game only once, but have made it to the final boss a few times. It also memorized the moves of so many different enemies, so so you know how to play around them. I find the runs to be relatively short, but very fun and easy to play back through again. I feel the replayability is very high, and everyone I've talked to in Twitch chat about this game says nothing but positive things about it. I will say I don't like the graphics too much, but that doesn't affect the addicting gameplay at all. With all the unique characters having their own cards, the many relics and potions, and very simple game to get into, I have to put this game in the A tier category, right ahead of Dead Cells and Skull, but right behind Returnal. Okay, 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 here's a game that I absolutely struggled with in my short amount of playing time, and I never even got past the first world, and that's Spelunky 2. It was initially released in September of 2020 on PlayStation 4, and slowly released on every main platform. It's a 2D platform game where you play as Anna, who travels to the moon to find their parents. You play through procedurally generated levels, all of which have traps and enemies that can kill you so easily. You can collect treasures to gain money to buy items from shops, and if you end up saving the dog in the level, you get one extra health. And health does not reset on a new level, so you only have so much health in an entire run. Now, I will admit, I don't know much about this game, and it was probably my least played game on the list, but holy crap, this game was incredibly hard, based on what I played. And you know, I won't call a game bad because it's hard. This game is phenomenal. Every run, the levels look so new, and the enemies are always somewhere new as well. 
The mechanics seem really simple and mastering them will provide you with a very satisfying experience. I beat a level in like 15 seconds and it felt great. Died the next level, but hey, I had one good moment. Now I will admit it's not my favorite game. I love the speedrun aspect of the game and if you master it, you can absolutely zoom and the runs are so fast and unique, it's amazing. But with that said, I'm still only gonna put this game in the middle of the B rank. Like previous games, I feel like I need to play it a little bit more if I want to put it in A. But everyone that speaks highly of Spelunky 2, I can totally see why. But it's so hard, but so satisfying. And well, all right, we finally made it to the final game and probably the most simple looking game with Vampire Survivors. It was released as a browser source game on itch.io for free in March of 2021, and it got put into early access on Steam at the end of 2021 for a solid $3. The gameplay is super simple. You pick a character and try to survive as long as you can as waves of enemies attack you. When you kill an enemy, there's a chance they will drop XP, and when you level up, you can pick one of three or four choices where you get a new weapon, gain a passive ability like more damage, or you can upgrade a current ability. Every level up lets you choose, and as more time goes on, more enemies will spawn. You can shoot down light sources to get gold or other useful items, and the gold will carry over into your collection. But you start every run with zero gold, and the gold can be used to unlock permanent upgrades to you or the enemy and unlockable characters. The game also has a handful of maps that unlock the better you do. I really find this game so simple, but it's so addicting. All you have to do is use a single joystick or just WASD to move around and then let the weapons do all the work. Every room does also seem to have a max time limit, so the runs may only last for a certain amount of time. And even when you think you have a totally busted loadout, you could get cocky and lose out of nowhere. Well, that's what happened to me. Honestly, I'm going to put this game right at the end of A tier. It's one of the least accessible games at the moment. It's only available on PC, but I see this game being released everywhere somewhere near in the future. And for $3, that's cheaper than most of the games on the list. Granted, I will say a lot of the games on this list are available on Xbox Game Pass or go on sale frequently. But for $3, Vampire Survivors does it really well. Well, uh, that's every roguelike I've played in the past couple of months in a tierless format. I know I missed a handful of highly regarded games like Risk of Rain 2, Rogue Legacy, Crypt of the Necrodancer, and really so much more. But I felt this was a pretty solid list, one that justified a roguelike tier list. And I'm sorry if I missed any super important info on any of the games. But all of these games are pretty good. Some were great and some of them were amazing. I appreciate you watching this video and I will see you next time. Oh, and also, sub if you enjoyed it. I try to make videos when I can on any games that catch my eye. You can also watch me live on Twitch. Okay, bye.